start by talking about ChatGPT. How many of you have used ChatGPT? Pretty much, yep, all of you. How many of you have used ChatGPT and then read about the climate impact of ChatGPT and felt quite guilty for using ChatGPT? Yeah, a few of us. When, when you look at the, the numbers for ChatGPT, they're, they're not good. Um, and what's, what's interesting as well is the trend we're seeing. So if you look at the amount of compute which is used to train these large deep learning models like ChatGPT, like others, anybody want to guess how much it's gone up in six years? It's a lot. So it's 30, 300, 300,000 times more compute is used for these models now than six years ago. And you might say, okay, yeah, but this is kind of a, a fake, stupid statistic because six years ago, none of us were really talking about these large language models, and now we all are. But it's not just the fact that the field has grown. It's the size, the reason we're talking about these models is because they're more useful. The reason they're more useful is because the amount of data in them is growing exponentially. And with that exponential growth in data is an exponential growth in compute. And so we just see this sort of quite scary upward curve. So I think then it's sort of easy to say, okay, well, I, I occasionally use ChatGPT, but I am not doing deep learning. I am just a developer. This is someone else's environmental destruction, not my environmental destruction. And we used to talk about Bitcoin as well and cryptocurrency. And in 2018, the energy usage for cryptocurrency was about the same as the energy usage of all of Denmark, which is kind of terrifying. But again, it's sort of easy to say, okay, well, I am not doing Bitcoin mining. So it's someone else's bad behavior. But actually, this is something that really all of us are involved in. And when we think about sort of the poster child for having a really large, irresponsible carbon footprint, most of us tend to think of aviation and flying. But if you look at the digital world overall, the carbon footprint of the digital world is about twice the carbon footprint of flying. So this is, this is big. And that includes, that includes everything. So that includes things like devices, mobile phones, what we do at home. And so again, you may say, okay, well, that's, that's quite a, I am not a hardware person. This is, this is nothing to, to do with me. But if you look just at what's running in data centers, data centers use as much energy as a, a medium country. So about the same as the UK, a bit less than Brazil. And if you add in, here this is just data centers, but energy usage comes from data centers, but it also comes from the network traffic. Because what is a network except a whole bunch of little computers that are connected by wires? So when you send data along the network, every time it goes through a switch, there's energy used. And if you count the network traffic as well, then we have a really quite big energy usage. And who's writing the things? that run in these data centers. That's us, right? We're, we're using the cloud services. We're deploying applications that get hosted in the cloud where they're in a data center and counted to this statistic. Um, I should say as well, the solution is not to say, I'm not gonna use the cloud, I'm gonna host locally, because then you won't be in that statistic but your application will be running in a much, much less energy efficient way than it would if it was in a, a hyperscaler data center. So either way, we write code, that code runs, it adds up to a lot of energy. So that's kind of terrible. Um, here we are, the last day of the conference, and we've got doom, gloom, and environmental apocalypse. But I think it's not quite as terrible as all that. When we think about these kinds of really big problems, there's a couple of approaches that we can take. One is, there is no problem, I will just continue doing my thing, someone else's problem, I didn't want to have children anyway. Um, or the other one is to say, this is just awful, I am just a tiny 
little moat of dust in a huge thing. There is nothing I can do. There is nothing that anybody can do. Let's just give up and fly to Costa Rica. But there's a, a middle ground, which is about solutions. Because when we think about these things, not as something hopeless or as something irrelevant, but as something that can be fixed, that puts us on the path to finding solutions. And these solutions are within reach, and some of them are incredibly powerful. So then the question is, OK, Holly, I like the idea of doing something. I like the idea of being part of the solution. But what do I do? How do I, how do I do it? It's sort of easy to say, oh, just find a solution. And of course, it's a lot harder to actually figure out what these solutions are. I think one of the, the things that's changed recently, though, is that we now have a lot more guidance on what kinds of things we should be doing. So we've had several talks in this conference that had some you know, really practical suggestions for what we should be doing and some really sort of useful theoretical frameworks as well. So what the framework that makes sense to me is what comes from the Green Software Foundation. And they have a few principles. So the first thing that apps should be doing is carbon awareness. So this really is a question of where your application runs and also when your application runs. Because of course, solar power only works in the day. The next thing to look at is hardware efficiency. So this is really about elasticity and utilization. And I always say those in those or that order, elasticity and utilization, but it's actually the other way around. What we want is high utilization. We want our, our systems to be used, not wasted. And the way we get high utilization is by having elastic systems. And then the last thing to look at is electricity efficiency. So this is really about what we do as developers. It's about the algorithms that we write, and it's also about the stack that we choose to run our programs on. So let's look at the electricity first, source first. This brings me to the first easy trick to solve all of the world's problems, which is the electricity source. Not all, we sometimes I think think of electricity as green, we've got this move towards electric cars, electric everything, but not all electricity is created equal. And in particular, not all regions of the world create their electricity in the same way. Some parts of the world tend to have a lot of renewable infrastructure, and other parts of the world there's almost no renewable infrastructure. Um, this is sort of quite a simple map. I wouldn't necessarily use this for making your hosting decisions, um, but you can get much more precise data. So there's a really cool site called electricitymaps.com, and you can go to it and you can get the map, and you can sort of you can see you can sort of scroll around. You can see South Africa, very very dirty energy. Great Britain mm, could be better, could be worse. Uh, Poland definitely not. The Nordics very clean, as you would expect, although Denmark, slightly less clean. Um, and then, as well, what you can do is you can look at, you know, just the past 24 hours, or you can look at the overall trend. What you will see is, in a 24-hour period, it will change a lot. If it's sunny, some regions will become greener. But one of the most important things about this map is what you can see going on in Virginia. Because Virginia is blessed with many natural resources um, and many sort of location resources. Virginia is where the big transatlantic pipe comes in, the data pipe. And Virginia also has lots and lots of coal, which means that if you build a data center in Virginia, you have all of this coal to burn for electricity for your data center, which seemed like a really good idea a while ago and seems like a really terrible idea now. And for various re reasons, Virginia is, is finding it quite difficult to shift from a, a coal-dominated power supply to one which, which is more renewable. So if, when you create a cloud resource, you just, usually US East 1 is the thing at the top of the list, which is in Virginia. So if you just automatically click that, it's getting run on quite dirty energy. So. Jez mentioned this as well. 
when when you choose to deploy something, look at the sustainability information and choose a cloud provider that makes it easy. So it used to be a few years ago, it was really, really hard to try and figure out the carbon footprint of each region. Now it surfaced much more widely. So this is good. Continue to use your power as consumers to try and push cloud providers in this direction. The other thing that matters is the time of day. And this is a little bit harder. So when you, when you just choose a region, that's just a one-off thing and it's done. With the time of, the, the nature of renewables is that except for hydroelectricity, most renewables are what's called intermittent, which means sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. When you're thinking about application reliability, obviously sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, isn't really going to be an acceptable SLO. So we need to find ways of covering those gaps. Often those gaps are covered by going back to the grid and firing up the coal plants. So that's not ideal, but there are things that we can do, again, in looking at that data about the sun is shining here, the wind is blowing here, that allows us to make decisions about where we host our, our workloads. And so we're starting to see things like carbon aware dispatching now, which it's really, you know, it's sort of, there's the data problem to actually figure out what electricity is greenest. And there's the orchestration problem as well of, can I take my workload and instead of choosing a region for it, does it still work if it sort of shuttles around the globe following the greenest energy? It, it may need a little bit of re-architecting to be able to tolerate that. And the services that do this are also still being developed, but it's a really good aspiration. So the next thing to look at is the hardware. So I mentioned elasticity and utilization. Utilization matters because as an industry, we are absolutely awful at utilizing our hardware. So in 2017, a team, they went and they surveyed a whole bunch of servers and they found that a quarter of these servers were doing no useful work. And by no useful work, I don't mean they were showing cat videos. What I mean is that they hadn't had a single data packet go in or out of that server for six months. And yet those servers were still, that's like such a high bar. And those servers were just spinning there using electricity when there was absolutely no, no value that they were providing in any way. And so then the authors of the, of the research sort of said, how did this happen? And the best thing that they could come up with was maybe someone forgot to turn them off. And I believe that because I have forgotten to turn off many, many servers in my life. And sometimes it's been quite expensive. We're really good at turning on servers and provisioning workloads. As people, we tend to be pretty bad at deprovisioning workloads for a whole bunch of reasons, forgetfulness, risk aversion, all sorts of things. So these zombie servers are pretty bad, but there's another category which is almost as bad. And these are the underutilized servers. And they're active less than 5% of the time. And there the metric is 29%. So if you add up those two numbers, you end up with almost two thirds of the servers are doing almost no work at all. And yet they're still using resources. And this is just so stupid. It's, you know, it's, it's one of those problems that you look at and think, surely, surely we can do better than this. And when you look at this kind of problem, I think the, the natural first response, I think, often is to say, ah, but that was the old world of physical servers. We've moved to the cloud now. I can assure you, I can forget a cloud server just as easily as I can forget a physical server. In fact, I think I can forget a cloud server more easily than I can a physical server because I can't even see it sat under my desk. And I love this quote from Corey Quinn, because we sort of tend to talk about the cloud as if the cloud is automatically elastic. But the cloud is only elastic if, if we do it. So Corey says, the beauty of cloud is in its elasticity. It lets you scale up to meet traffic demands. And then when that traffic wanes, you can keep your scaled up instances running in perpetuity to help send some engineer's kids to college. So that, you know, this idea that cloud is elastic, oh, maybe not. And we have, again, we have, research that, that backs this up, unfortunately. 
in 2021, they, they estimated that there was $26.6 billion, which is such a huge amount of money wasted by always on cloud instances. And this is so easy to fix as well. I saw a talk at um, DevOps Days Chicago and he's saying, they just did such a simple thing. They, they used to leave their applications running all the time and they just wrote a dumb little script to turn them off at night and they reduced their cloud bill by 30%. I heard another story. It was um, someone she was working in IT in a school and in the Netherlands, and she managed to save her school 12,000 euros a year just by turning the school computers off overnight. Again, it's such a huge amount of money for such a tiny amount of effort. And what we save when we do that is it's not just the electricity. If we can actually, not necessarily for the school IT where it's being turned off, but for something like applications running in the cloud where these servers are pooled and if you're not using it, someone else can use it, then what you're saving is not just the electricity, but you're saving the water involved in manufacturing hardware. And again, this can be huge. So for ChatGPT, I saw a statistic and it said that for, if you had like sort of a conversation that was 20 to 50 prompts, they reckoned that would use 500 milliliters of water. So a bottle of water per conversation, which is kind of terrifying. And then of course, there's the e-waste for all the servers. When they get built, then what happens to them at the end of their life is they get disposed of or not disposed of. And so we can, we can fix this. But of course, I mentioned that there's lots of reasons why, why applications get forgotten. Um, and a lot of it has to do with forgetfulness, <laughs> which we can solve by scripting. Um, but some of it has to do with the fact that a lot of us remember that when you turned an application off, it might come back on. It, it might be the same when it came back on. Or it might be that you would have to spend two days trying to patch it together to find the lost bit of config that hadn't ever actually been written down properly. So we're, again, we're seeing things get better in this area, but I think we have a lot, a lot of ways to go. So things like GitOps, where you have your infrastructure as code so that you know you can recreate your instances rather than relying on these really sort of ephemeral bits of state for them to keep working. But I think where we should be going as an industry is to a place where turning applications off and on is no more scary than turning the lights off and on. Because, you know, we would never in our house sort of go to turn the light off and then go, oh, but will I get in trouble if I turn the light off? Because what if tomorrow the light doesn't come back on? We just we know it will, and we know the light will work the same way. It's not like we turn the light off tonight and then tomorrow the light is blue when we turn it back on. We have that confidence in the ability of light to come back off and on, and we need to get to that same place with our applications. So a light switch really has this sort of ultimate elasticity that you can turn it off and on without fear. And for our applications, we can get there, but there's some ill at ease that, that we need to sort out first. So turning applications on it has to be fast. It can't be like, well, I turned it on and you know, 10 minutes later, I'll be able to serve my first user request. The application has to actually work. And so that's really means that we have to have item potency in our applications and we have to have resiliency in our applications. We can't have fragile applications. So I, I've sort of batched this idea of architecting things to be turn off and onable and then actually turning them off and on. Um, and I'm calling this light switch ops. No one else, to my knowledge, is calling it light switch ops yet, but I keep hoping that if I say it enough times, it, someone else will say it. And I just heard that there's, um, O'Reilly have a book on sustainable architecture coming out. And apparently, light switch ops is mentioned in that O'Reilly book, which will be, I, I have made it. Um, the risk is that the authors put it in and then some O'Reilly editor goes, what? No, this is terrible. And then, it, so we shall see. For the moment, light switch ops is, is in the book. But the other, the other thing about all of this is we can make measurements sort of guided by intuition and we can, you know, turn things off that we notice. But for any kind of optimization, you have to be guided by data. You can't optimize it if you can't measure it. 
so again, we're seeing some good progress in this area as well. So FinOps has really started not as an environmental um, concern. FinOps is about getting financial information flowing through your organization with the same kind of speed and ease that we tend to have IT information flowing through an organization. But what I really like to think of it as is figuring out who in your company forgot to turn off their cloud. Because if you have the, the reason we forget these things is we don't see them. If we have that information, we can start acting on it. So there's various FinOps tools around. Um, what appeals most to me is Backstage from Spotify. And I know there was a talk about it earlier in the conference. Um, Backstage has a whole bunch of plugins. Many of them have nothing to do with, with green or um, but there's a Cost Insights plugin, which really gets that financial information to the engineers. And there's also a Cloud Carbon Footprint plugin to actually make it literally carbon information. <clears throat> so the final thing to look at is electricity information. So electricity efficiency, what am I running? Um, is my application efficient? And the logical starting point here is to look at programming languages. Um, this is tempting for two reasons. One is it seems like one of the fun most fundamental characteristics of our stack. Um, but the other one is it lets us talk about why our language is so much better than the other language, because our language is really much better. Um, so there's this paper that came out a few years ago. They were running mi micro benchmarks, so take the results with a lot of salt. Um, but what you can see, here's my sort of condensed version of their results. Python at the bottom, about 80 times slower than C. On, the, on these benchmarks and 80 times more carbon heavy. Um, JavaScript, a lot of us love to laugh at JavaScript. JavaScript, for various interesting architectural reasons, surprisingly efficient for a, a script language. Um, on this benchmark, Go was a little bit lower than Java. And Java overall was about fifth in the ranking of 60 languages and it was about twice as twice as carbon footprinty as C, but still pretty okay. So if you want to see the sort of the, the full table, there it is, and you can see Java is fifth. But then the question is, if I'm, if I'm using Java, can I, can I make it more optimal? And the answer is yes. Yeah. So you can change your GC parameters and that kind of thing, and you can make a difference of about double. Um, so that's good. But there's other things that you can do as well. So how many of you, um, how many of you are using Java? Okay, about, about two thirds of you. Okay, cool. Because I'm going to talk in a little bit of detail about Java now because I, I, that's my day job. Um, but hopefully it will be interesting even to those of you who aren't doing Java. Because the question is, how do I make, if I am using Java, how do I make it as carbon efficient as possible? Um, and I, I work for Red Hat and I work on the Quarkus team. And Quarkus has a bunch of cool things, better user experience, that kind of thing. But one of the things that people often think of when they think of Quarkus is the fact that it is really incredibly efficient in terms of its resource usage. So much faster startup time, much lower um, memory footprint. And so then intuitively we kind of thought, surely it has to be that if it's so fast and efficient that has, it has a lower carbon footprint. But we didn't actually have the data. So if you don't have data, the thing to do is to measure rather than guess. Um, it turns out measuring carbon is hard. So um, how many of you were in Henrik's talk this morning? Okay, almost all of you. So I'm going to whiz through these slides because these are extremely similar to what Henrik showed. So you can measure carbon at the wall, but that's really boring and annoying, even though it's correct. Um, you can measure it using the REPL instrumentation in your CPU. That's not quite as correct, but it's much easier. Um, either way, you've probably forgotten the network, which is a bit of a shame. Um, if you're in the cloud, then good luck with either of those. The cloud is a black box. That is, that is the beauty and the joy of the cloud, is it's a black box until you want to know what your carbon footprint is, and then you're a bit stuck. Um, but there are things we can do. If you know the load of your system, then you can work from your load using publicly available data sets collected by TEEDS, who are an advertising agency, weirdly. Um, and they have this data set that allows you to go, if you're using AWS, from your AWS instance, if you know what the load is, you can get a carbon foot, and you know what region you're in, you can get a carbon footprint. So once you've got your computer and your load, 
you know what region you're in. With the published energy mix, you can then get a carbon, sort of, as long as you don't try and compare across cloud providers. Again, good luck with that. And then you're almost there. And the last thing to consider is the embedded car carbon. So even if you're running on 100% green energy, there was a lot of carbon used to manufacture the actual server. So that makes a difference. This is good, um, but it has a few drawbacks. One is it's kind of work, which is annoying. I always try and avoid work when possible. So there are some simpler models that you can use. When I show these models um, around people who are professional sustainability experts, I can see them sort of turning gray and twitching in the audience. And I know I have to like make a really hasty exit after the talk. Um, these models are not anything like as accurate as doing it in a more correct way, but they're really useful as heuristics to allow you to optimize, which is the most important thing. So this leads me to the next trick, which is the Vroom model. Vroom model is a bit like light switch ops. It's something that I totally made up. Um, but if you go back to that little paper that compared the, the, that looked at the carbon footprint across various languages, you'll see that they have two columns. Um, this column is how much energy was used, which allows you to get the carbon. This column is how long the program took to, let, to run. And you can see if you compare those two columns, each one is normalized, they're almost exactly the same. Like, and the position of each language is almost exactly the same. There's a few places where it varies, but overall, if your program runs faster, that probably means it's using less energy, which is a good thing. So the energy consumption is sort of mostly, please don't quote this to a sustainability expert, proportional to the execution time, which is cool. Um, but there's another trick that you can use as well, which is called the economic model. And that one isn't actually a made up name, I got it from Adrian, Adrian Cockcroft, but it's short for the economic input output life cycle assessment, which is why it's called the economic model. And what the economic model tells you is that if you reduce your cloud spend or your hardware spend or your electricity bill, depending how you're hosting, then you're probably reducing your carbon footprint as long as you keep other factors the same. If you reduce your electricity bill by putting everything onto someone else's data center, that maybe doesn't count. But overall, if you're keeping everything else the same and you see these things changing, you're going in the right direction. So as sort of an example of, of how this might work in action, sort of, um, let's look at the carbon footprint of ChatGPT. I mentioned it was large. Um, what we can do is we can sort of start by looking at the cost of ChatGPT, but it turns out that's really hard to get. Um, the ranges that you see are enormous. So I've, I saw one, one article where they said it cost $700,000 a day to run ChatGPT, which is just a phenomenal amount of money. Other estimates said it was $50,000, which is still a huge amount of money, but compared to $700,000 is like, seems really reasonable. Um, the training costs are even bigger. So it costs somewhere between 3 million and 50 million to train ChatGPT. So it's enormously, enormously resource expensive, resource intensive. There's just banks of GPUs that are chewing away. So at this point, I thought, well, there's no point trying to calculate the carbon footprint because if we have so little certainty about how many resources are being used, actually all we can say is the carbon footprint is a lot. So I stopped. Um, but what that does tell you is if you don't know what your costs are, good luck finding your carbon footprint. So back to Quarkus. When I, when I started, we, we didn't have any experiments about the carbon footprint, but we did have a good set of experiments about the cost. And what we did was we took a, sort of a typical application and we hosted it on the cloud and we fired loaded it for 20 days. So we didn't want like a benchmark where it just sort of stood up for 10 minutes and then stopped. We wanted something that was realistic. And we tried to see what was the smallest instance we could run an application on. Um, so if we had sort of 
a more traditional framework um, that many of you Java people are probably using, um, we had to run on a T2 medium instance. With Quarkus, you can either run it as a natively compiled application or you can run it on JVM. For each of those, we found we could go to a T2 micro instance. Using the TEADS dataset, we can go from that to a carbon footprint. And again, so you can see Quarkus, the carbon footprint is about half what it is for the alternative framework. And the thing to note with this is the, so the, the, um, the line is the cost, the bars are the carbon footprint. They're not exactly the same, but they're pretty close. If you're, if you're reducing one, you're reducing the other. So then the next question is, okay, can we actually measure this without relying on, on approximations? Can we actually measure the, the energy usage? So we did those experiments. And again, we had it in our lab and we just fired requests at it um, and plotted how much energy was used to handle that volume of requests. And so on this graph, lower is better. So you can see that Quarkus on JVM was most carbon efficient. Quarkus on native was next. Um, the alternative framework on JVM was next. And the alternative framework on negative really has a very, very high carbon footprint. Um, so what's, what's going on here? In particular, why is native having a higher carbon footprint than JVM? Because native starts so fast and it uses so little memory. How, how can it have more footprint? And certainly when I saw these results, I thought they must be backwards. Um, but what we're seeing here is the Vroom model in action. So when you run a natively compiled Java application, you take a throughput hit. And at these kinds of loads, throughput is actually the most important thing for the carbon footprint, not the startup time, because you only start up an application once, and then you handle workload for the rest of its life. And again, the, the memory footprint makes a difference, but the throughput made the most big. It's, Quarkus on JVM has the highest throughput, so it has the lowest carbon footprint. If, I meant, so the Vroom model, um, it is a little bit incomplete because the, the carbon footprint of an application is made up of the throughput and also the memory footprint. So if you have a really huge memory footprint, even if your throughput is good, maybe, maybe it's not gonna be so good. But in this case, the memories were close enough that throughput was the dominant factor. And as it happens for Quarkus, I work for Quarkus, this makes me very happy because we are most efficient for the startup time, we're most efficient for throughput, and we're most efficient for, for memory. So then trick five is <laughs> use Quarkus. Um, but what we find with Quarkus is, you know, just by sort of switching to Quarkus, it's saving, it's, it's the developer experience is better, it, it's got more throughput, it's cloud costs are lower, you ha about have the, the carbon. Um, and my colleague, he does a really nice um, talk where what he does is he takes a Spring application, because we've got um, a Spring compatibility layer in Quarkus. So he takes the Spring compatibility, um, he takes a Spring application and then switches the dependencies to be the Quarkus Spring compatibility libraries and then reruns the application and it runs twice as fast. So it's sort of, it can be a really minimal change. He does have to change the tests. The testing model is different, but on the actual application, this tiny change to the dependencies, even though all of the application code is exactly the same, makes a really cool saving. So, where does that leave us? Um, this all still sounds like a little bit of work, um, but I think, I think it's okay, because one of the things that's not in the Green Software Foundation model, which I think is really important, is this idea of utility, which is, is the thing that we're doing actually giving somebody a benefit? Is it giving us a benefit? And so much of what we do with our computers is actually completely useless. And again, I don't mean cat videos, 
where someone somewhere is made happy by the cat video. Um, actually, this is a complete digression, but watching a comedy video can improve productivity quite significantly. So cat videos, I think it's something like test scores go up by about 12% after people have watched a comedy video. So cat videos have this really pragmatic, useful function for increasing test scores. So what I'm talking about instead is things like often when someone wants to listen to a song and they're at their computer, the easiest way to get the song is to go to YouTube and get the video of that song. So they'll go to YouTube, get the video of the song, and then have the YouTube video in the background. So it's streaming all of that. The video part is the expensive part of the stream. It's streaming all of that video data just in order to get the sound. So wouldn't it be nice if there was a little option that said, hey, do you just want the sound? If so, turn off the video. And there's all sorts of examples of this. So for example, often in CI, I'll, I'll run a CI job and I know I don't care about the result because I've just put in a second one but I haven't cancelled the first one and there's all this sort of stuff where we could just get rid of the crap and we're not losing anything at all and yet we're we're making things more useful and so many of the the climate solutions that we talk about now are in this kind of category. They're called no regret solutions. So the idea isn't, you know, sort of, I want to save the world, so I need to wear my hair shirt and I need to, you know, get rid of everything that I care about. It's, I can get rid of things that I didn't even care about and save the world. So why wouldn't you? Um, there's a bunch of different names for this idea. What's, what's used in the climate literature is co-benefits, which I don't think is super clear. Hands up if co-benefits really makes sense to you. Yeah. Um, I sometimes talk about the double win, but I'm not sure if that's very clear either. Sometimes I talk about win-win. Uh, still not sure it's clear. Sometimes I talk about one plus one equals three, but then it's still not clear and I look like I can't do math. So I, I stopped doing that one. Um, in, in the US, they would sometimes talk about it as a twofer. But again, if you're not in the US, then you have to spend quite a long time explaining and you sort of lost it. Um, someone suggested to me that I should call it the Überwinden. Um, and I don't speak German. And as far as I can tell, he didn't speak German either. Because every time I've shown this to someone who speaks German, they look at me like I'm an idiot and point out that it actually doesn't mean anything like what I'm trying to say. Um, so the moral of all of this is that it's really good and I have no idea what to call it, sorry. But the idea is, I think, really important, which is that climate solutions, they can make everything better, not just the climate. So like, if you remember those, those zombie servers, the, the always on public cloud instances that were costing 26 billion, imagine what else you could do with $26 billion, you could, buy ice cream. I mean, you could do all sorts of amazing things. You know, you could have holidays, office parties, you know, you could have universal housing. It's so cool. And turning things off just saves a lot of money. But we see, we see similar benefits in other areas. So it's not just, you know, turn things off to save money. For example, renewable, at the moment, it didn't always used to be this way, but at the moment, renewable energy is nine times cheaper than fossil fuel energy. So that means that if you're hosting in Montreal, for example, it's 88% less carbon than the same workload in London, and it's 15% cheaper. Um, and the numbers are sort of quite similar for hosting in Stockholm. So you sort of think, oh, I could host in the expensive, dirty place or in the cheap, clean place. What should I choose? Hmm, let me think about this really hard. It's like, no, you don't need to think about it. It's really easy. It's, it's cheaper. And and with the Vroom model as well, like I, I love this model for a couple of reasons. One is because it's got a ridiculous name. But the other thing is because it's just so, the implications are so good. Because when we, when I was buying a car a while ago, I had to make a choice of like, I really wanted a fast car that went fast, but I sort of didn't want to get a really big engine because that would be environmentally wrong. So there was this sort of trade-off. But with software, the faster it goes, the cleaner it is. So there is no trade-off. 
And so Jonathan Foley, he, he talks a lot about this no regrets idea. And I love this quote because he says, climate solutions are just better ways to do the things we want to do. Unless you're a major shareholder in an oil company or something, most climate solutions will just make your life and your community better. And again, you know, we, we see this with, with Quarkus. When people try Quarkus, they sort of tend to come to us and say, I came for the performance reasons and actually I'm really, really loving this user experience. So with, with all of this, I think it's not, it's not sacrifice, it's not sort of penitential, it's making things better, which is really good. So for the TLDPA, which is too long, didn't pay attention, um, trick one, choose your hosting wisely. Trick two, architect things so that you can turn them off and on, which is the light switch ops. Trick three, the Vroom model says faster is greener. Trick four is that the economic model says cheaper is greener. And trick five, use Quarkus. But ultimately with all of it, you know, I think this is something that we're not, we're not powerless. This is something where all of us and the actions of all of us can make a difference, which is good because we don't want to be powerless. We want to be powerful.